I am going to speak about an article titled The Tragedy of the Commons, published in 1968, written by ecologist Garrett Hardin. Before the explanation of what the tragedy of the commons is, I would like you to focus on the game of tic-tac-toe. Each of you probably knows this game and each of you probably knows that it is impossible to win this game, unless your opponent is a complete dump. Important is that the problem of winning the game has no technical solution. We are going to focus only on those problems with no technical solution. Technical solution is the one that requires a change only in the techniques of the natural sciences, demanding little or nothing in the way of change in human values or ideas of morality. In the article Hardin concerns especially in the population problem. It is the problem that population tends to grow exponentially, so there must come a day when the world will be too small for us. Of course, for some time, we can have the technical solution. We can for example build sea cities and large buildings, and we can think of new and more efficient ways to gather food. But let us compute. To live, an organism must have a source of energy. For men, maintenance of life requires about a thousand and six hundred kilocalories a day, and that is just the maintenance, without work, without sports, or having fun in any possible way. We gain most of our energy from sun. This is a constant value of energy per time, and the important is that it is not infinite. So we don't have infinite energy. Therefore, we cannot have infinite population, which means that the population growth must eventually equal zero. Let us leave the population problem for a while and explain the term tragedy of the commons. Commons are common things. It means when a group of people share something together. Picture a pasture open to all people from a village. Let's imagine that it can feed hundred sheep. Each herdsman will try to keep as many cattle as possible on the commons. Each herdsman asks himself, what is the utility to me of adding one more animal to my herd? The positive component is a function of the increment of one animal. Since the herdsman receives all the proceeds from the sale of the additional animal, the positive utility is nearly plus one. The negative component is a function of the additional overgrazing created by one more animal. Since, however, the effects of overgrazing are shared by all the herdsmen, the negative utility for any particular decision-making herdsman is only a fraction of minus one. Rational herdsman concludes that the best choice for him is to add another animal to his herd, and another, and another. Soon there are 200 sheep and eat the grass with roots so the pasture can now feed only 20 sheep. The freedom in commons brings ruin to all. The solution for this problem is a private property. We remove the commons by dividing the pasture and each herdsman will have his own piece of the pasture and it is his own responsibility to keep the numbers of the cattle below the capacity of his pasture. There are plenty of other problems in the group of tragedy of the commons. A very similar case is fishery. Instead of the common pasture we have oceans. Oceans belongs to all with all the fish there. Every fisherman wants to fish as many fish as possible. But with this attitude there will soon be no fish at all in the oceans. Of course there are some solutions. For example we can set the borders of a coastal state for example, a hundred kilometers from the coast, and say that this part of the ocean is a private property of the state. But fish aren't looking for borders, and they are moving freely. A better solution is to control each fishman and set some limits for fishing. Pollution is another tragedy of the commons. Here we have kind of an inverse problem to the open pasture, because we don't take something out of the commons, but we put something in. But we cannot avert pollution by private property. We can't have, for example, our own piece of air when factories are wasting noxious and dangerous fumes into the air or putting wastes into the water. The calculations of utility are much the same as before. 
the rational man finds that his share of the cost of the wastes he discharges into the commons is less than the cost of purifying his wastes before releasing them. Since this is true for everyone, we are locked into a system of fouling our own nest. So long as we behave only as independent, rational and free enterprises. The pollution problem is a consequence of population. In the past, when the population wasn't so dense, you could discharge wastes into the water and it purified itself. But as the population grows, the natural, chemical and biological recycling processes became overloaded. Analysis of the pollution problem as a function of population density uncovers a not generally recognized principle of morality. Namely, the morality of an act is a function of the state of the system at the time it is performed. For example, 200 years ago a plainsman could kill a bison, cut only the tongue for dinner and discard the rest of the animal. He was not in any important sense being wasteful. Today, with only a few thousand bison left, we would be appalled at such behavior. That morality is system sensitive escaped the attention of most codifiers of ethics in the past. You shall not is the form of traditional ethical directives which make no allowance for particular circumstances. The laws of our society follow the pattern of ancient ethics and therefore are poorly suited to governing a complex, crowded, changeable world. We need to augment the statutory law with an administrative law. We can have watchers who say what is good and what isn't under particular circumstances or state of the system respectively. We don't want to say you shall not do this, but you can do this, but not so much that it would be bad. So we want a kind of temperance of people. Now we can return to the problem of overpopulation. If each human family were dependent only on its own resources, if the children of improvident parents starved to death, or if overbreeding brought its own punishment, then the question of how many children parents would have would not be a matter of public concern. But our society is committed to the welfare state, which helps big families. So how can we deal with the family, the religion, the race, or any other class that adopts overbreeding as its policy. We need a temperance in breeding too. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights describes the family as the natural and fundamental unit of society. It follows that any choice and decision with regard to the size of the family must irrevocably rest with the family itself and cannot be made by anyone else. Hardin says in his article that if we love the truth, we must openly deny the validity of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, even though it is promoted by the United Nations. He says that no technical solution can rescue us from the misery of overpopulation. Freedom to breed will bring ruin to all. The only way is by relinquishing the freedom to breed, and that very soon. Only so can we put an end to this aspect of the tragedy of the commons. Do you agree with such a radical solution?